you're an economist, you're a central bank watcher. Should the Fed, is it the right thing for the Fed to do to speed up the taper, to look at bringing the rate hike path up uh, faster, sooner, maybe doing more rate hikes than people are expecting? Is that what, what needs to be done to fight inflation? Look, I, I think so. I, I think this idea that um, central banks are running a riskless strategy by waiting for inflation to be fully in evidence, uh, well entrenched in their in their target ranges, uh, before they start to move monetary conditions off this, the most stimulatory level the world's ever seen, um, I think that comes with a whole lot of risks. Um, you need to move much more quickly. You need to get rates closer to neutral. You don't really, in real time, know where neutral is. The possibility of an accident with that approach seems much higher to me. So. The Reserve Bank of Australia, which meets tomorrow, is in a very different position, although inflation has picked up somewhat. And the economy is looking a lot brighter, isn't it? Uh, even with the Omicron still hanging over it, uh, not expected to do anything. But what about the communication? What Does this make any difference? Persistent inflation in the U.S., uh, a, a major central bank that's going to speed up the tightening, perhaps. Does it have implications for the RBA? Probably not, to be honest. The bank, the bank here has really sketched out this, you know, we're different um, perspective, and they've given a range of pretty solid reasons for why uh, inflation in Australia is likely to be different from the US and some other places. I suspect some of those factors will erode more quickly than the Reserve Bank of Australia thinks. But that's their narrative at the moment. And remember, this is a central bank that has undershot its inflation target for quite a long period of time. Um, there are risks that come with tightening later, as I suggested, but I think for the Reserve Bank of Australia, there are risks they're willing to take because they don't want to have the other problem, which is inflation uh, undershooting for an extended period again. Is there a credibility gap when you take a look at trader expectations, market expectations on when the tightening cycle will begin and what Phil Lowe keeps saying, particularly as they didn't go in to defend the yield target? Credibility gap's probably a, quite a strong way of saying it. I think for the Reserve Bank, particularly the way that the three-year yield target ended has, probably, has caused quite a bit of consternation among market participants. Um, they were supporting a three-year bond target that they thought was official, and then, of course, um, it, it ended quite prematurely in, in a very disruptive way. Um, so there's always some sceptical questioning, I think, of central bank forecasts and expectations around the economy. I think there's probably a bit more questioning and expectation given the way the three-year yield target ended. So in terms of... Uh, we are also... Um, Richard, I wanted to get your views on China. Of course, it is a big week. Of course, we do have uh, inflation data as well as a trade expecting to stay resilient as well. But is the bigger focus on how we get a resolution in the property sector with the potential Evergrande restructuring? What are the risks that you assign to that, particularly in terms of the regional impact? Property is a big focus. I don't, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I, markets largely, I think, have centred on this idea that um, there's going to be a, a relatively orderly uh, reduction in leverage in the Chinese property sector that will have flow-ons in terms of economic growth. Uh, our, our GDP forecast for next year is 4.6%. That's the lowest in you know modern history, certainly in this period where China has become such an important and integral part of the global economy. But, of course, the property restructuring is part of a broader policy shift. And I think, uh, in sum, the, sh the shared prosperity agenda is, is the biggest market watch for China. What structural implications does that have? How soft will China's economic growth be over the next few years? So, Richard, uh, when you look at uh, stock and bond markets uh, around the world and you see this, at least in the U.S., this pullback from risk, is, is this any kind of risk to Asian markets, to Asian economies, if we see this proceeding more broadly? It, it probably is a little bit, but Asia, I would say, is as well placed as I've seen the region um, to, to cope with a Fed tightening cycle. Sure, China economically is softer, but, uh, you know, there's the great indexing story in China, which is attracting capital. In contrast to the period before the taper tantrum in 2013, the small markets in Asia haven't seen this avalanche of new investment. Um, it's actually been the, the regional investment story really has been a China story, and I think there's some 
really solid reasons for that. Uh, and economic fundamentals in the region look good. Balance of payment surpluses look pretty healthy, uh, you know, as, as a general proposition. So the, the Fed can hike and, you know, we'll find where in the global economy and the global financial system there are vulnerabilities. Um, I don't think Asia is it this time.